Adam, you know, these patients in general progress. We've seen the PFS differences a little over two months and the median survival, although seven months greater, is still, you know, a little over two years uh, with a rare exception. What do you do after patients progress on atezolizumab and nabpaclitaxel? And then also um, in patients who are the 60% who are negative, what are you uh, offering those patients? So, I mean, it's this great question. I mean, we really, all we have at this point are the standard chemos. I mean, you know, we have typically a ribulin, uh, capecitabine, gemcitabine, carboplatin. I mean, these are the sort of things we have. If the patient's BRCA positive, uh, she'll likely be offered a, a PARP inhibitor. Um, I think there's some exciting things that, uh, you know, COVID crisis or not, will hopefully make it into the public domain fairly soon. I think one of them that I'm particularly uh, excited about is sasituzumab. Um, I think that while the phase three trial is not complete, um, I think that uh, the phase two looked pretty good in women who had had three, uh, two or three more, two or three, uh, two or more, three or more uh, therapies for triple negative disease. And uh, there was a reasonable uh, response rate and reasonable progression free survival benefit. So, I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that are out there right on the horizon, sasituzumab in particular, uh, that we can have where people progress uh, on, a, say, atezolizumab and uh, uh, nanoparticle paclitaxel. Yeah, it's an interesting question. There's also AKT inhibitors that right. are being tested, and we should see results right. from phase three trials maybe as early as next year. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, sasetizumab govotecan, we hope to see you know regulatory approval this year at some point um, based on the phase two data, accelerated approval. Uh, there are other antibody drug conjugates that are being tested in triple negative disease, which I think will be interesting as well. And then just as we um, close about this particular case and move on to the next one, uh, Ian, is there, what is your thought about the neoadjuvant to adjuvant type uh, trials that are going on with checkpoint inhibitors? Do you think that's going to be the way of the future? Uh, I hope so. Um, I think that, uh, you know, just as, as Adam was saying, we don't have a lot to offer our uh, patients beyond chemotherapy right now uh, in the metastatic setting, uh, uh, other than other than first-line checkpoint in inhibition um, for a subset. You know, we're stuck with chemotherapy alone in the, in the early disease setting as well, and we know that that's not adequate or sufficient for a lot of our patients. Um, so, you know, the data um, uh, from the keynote studies showing that uh, there is a uh, statistically significant improvement in pathological date response of about 14% with the addition of uh, pembrolizumab to standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy is encouraging. Um, and even more so, you know, this hint from the early uh, readout of, of um, long-term outcome that it seems like there may be a benefit for the checkpoint inhibitor there as well. And what's even more exciting is it doesn't even seem to be uh, just uh, in the patients who are pd one positive, both pd one positive and pd one negative patients seem to benefit. Um, so, you know, at least in the, in the neoadjuvant uh, using PCR as an endpoint, we don't know about that uh, in terms of long-term outcome. Um, so, I mean, to me, that's the potential game changer in this field, um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get the data um, as, as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think that um, there is something about having both a uh, more intact immune system and also having, there's something about having local disease, even versus de novo metastatic disease, uh, where the tumor is uh, relatively less resistant overall to therapy. So. I think I'm hopeful that this will make a really big difference, but I also think we've seen some data that suggests that the chemotherapy that's used is also really important. And I think what you've said and what you said in HER2 positive disease really emphasizes the, uh, the point I think we all feel strongly about, which is that these patients should receive therapy in the neoadjuvant setting so that we can uh, better understand how treatment after surgery in patients who don't have a pathologic complete response can alter outcome whether that's you know immune checkpoint inhibitors up front or afterwards or giving capecitabine or who knows, platinum salts, we just don't know. But I, I think it's a really critical lesson uh, for all of us that uh, these patients should be treated in the neoadjuvant setting if at all possible. It's exciting that we have an option now for patients that may change outcomes. Some of us have patients now who've been on single agent atezolizumab after dropping the chemotherapy following the approach of Impassion 130. Uh, certainly patients tire of chemo eventually. 
So we continue them on uh, their checkpoint inhibitor alone. And uh, some patients, you know, we have out, I think my, my patient who's the farthest out is just coming up on a year. And that's really pretty striking for patients who had uh, one and a half year median survival in impatient 130. Having the Keno 355 data, if we have patients we can treat with effective therapy who are after who relapse at six months or greater will also be really helpful. Um, Adam, I think we'll move on to the next case, but Adam just wanted to ask if you had any last comment. No, I mean, I think this is an area where we had nothing a few years ago other than chemo, and now we're going to have a lot of new things. I think it'd be really exciting. The 60% of patients who didn't have pdl one positive disease are being addressed in a number of different studies that are looking at combining immunotherapy or even giving chemo as an induction uh, and then adding in immunotherapy. So maybe we'll see some improvements there as well.